I mean, I think this week there will be, I don't know which day it is. Do you know which day will be the tutorial? Friday. Friday is the tutorial. So you should do the homeworks. Because, you know, the, if you look at the notes, there are lots of exercises given. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you should do the homeworks and I don't know till what uh, chapter. Okay, the first chapter probably is very simple, right? Yeah. The second, uh, second and third chapters. Yeah, but, uh, try to do these exercises and you can submit it to um, the, 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 the tutor, no? Okay. Uh, Arnab, Arnab, uh, yeah. So you can uh, submit to him and then probably, I mean, he will tell you that you know, exactly when he first meets you. So if you have already the first homework ready, you know, first uh, few chapters, I don't know, let, let's see. Let's see. One, two, two, three. Everybody feels crisis, actually. Yeah, I don't know, maybe up to the chapter four. Or, okay, let, why don't you take a look at the exercises okay. today, and then tomorrow we can uh, discuss again, and then you will tell me how many exercises you can do, no? Up to third chapter, maybe, or fourth chapter, something like that. Okay. And it's very important to do the exercises, huh? uh, because uh, that is the way you uh, you really uh, know that you understood subject. So it's um, it's a way to learn more. Okay, so we were uh, we had we had discussed the uh, SU two. Yeah. So we uh, last time we uh, showed how the in the joint representation SU two matrices uh, were in fact. SO3 matrices, right? Yeah, that is uh, that's uh, quite uh, a remarkable fact. It doesn't happen in general. I mean, this is a specific case for SU2 and a few other groups that it happens. But uh, generally, that doesn't happen. That uh, a, a joint representation is again a group. It will be a subgroup of something else, but uh, not, uh, uh, not. I mean, in this case, it just gives you directly SO3. It will be double covered. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, I have a question yeah. that might be slightly off topic, but uh, about the expectation values of uh, operators in the quantum mechanics. It corresponds to here uh, expectation values of uh, matrices if we talk about finite uh, representations of it. Uh, yeah, okay, of course, in quantum mechanics, yeah, you can of course talk about the. Uh, exactly. You can talk about it, but uh, in a given representation, you can talk about it. So, yeah, yeah. so it depends on representation, right? Sure. What we exactly. expect. Exactly. So we cannot uh, a priori say that uh, this operator has that expectation of the brother. We can say that with that yeah. specific yeah. representation. Yeah. Get, is it invariant uh, under a specific representation without dependence on the basis? Uh, uh, I mean, it depends on what you're asking for, right? I mean, uh, okay, so if you want a group invariant object, then uh, you ask for a Casimir, for example. Mm -hmm. A Casimir will be, it will depend on the which representation you're talking about, but it doesn't matter. I mean, under a SU2 rotation or the group rotation, uh, nothing changes. Casimir is in there. Because the results are uh, scale, it's a number, yeah. but it might change if it's not like something like Cas Casimir or. If it's a Casimir, it will not change it under the group rotation. But being a number does not uh, uh, satisfy it. It, it, it can change, although it's a number. No. Uh, I mean, the two things. Uh, okay, suppose I want to ask what is the expectation value of sigma 3? Uh, sigma 3 in, the, in a given representation. Okay. Uh, it will be, of course, zero. I mean, we'll see that. Uh, but, uh, so that itself, in any case, that will not be a group invariant concept, right? Uh, because under rotation, sigma 3 will can go to sigma 1 or sigma 2, etc. Yes, yes. So, however, there are some things called passivators, uh, which are totally invariant. I mean, they commute with all the real of elements, which means, therefore, the entire group will leave that invariant, right? So that will depend on which representation. So again, you can compute the expectation value of that, but it will depend on which representation you have. Each representation will have different value for the customers. Is the Casimir operator the, 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 the lens of the 
uh, operator vector. So we have sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. So is it sigma one squared plus sigma two yeah, squared plus correct, sigma correct. Three? Yeah. But why is it, is it called Casimir? Well, that is in this particular case, SU2 case. Uh, in general, there will be, if you go to S higher groups, there are more than one Casimir. It's not just quadratic Casimir. I mean, this is quadratic, no? Mm. You can have a cubic, quadratic, all, all these things. But so yeah, for SU2, it is a quadratic. So is Casimir effect, is the, the Casimir, sorry, operators, the operators that commute with all the generators? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's the definition. That's the definition. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, in general, we'll see that, uh, I mean, uh, if, if you take any of these groups, and I mean, the real algebra, if you take any particular generator and ask what's the expectation value of that in a given representation, it will be zero. Always. Yeah. I mean, for a, for a certain, for the class of Lie algebras we'll be studying, so-called simple Lie algebras, that will be always zero. So, so it's not very useful. However, if you have a U1 theory, take a U1 theory, you, have, you can have a charge. I mean, the generator is basically just measures a charge, right? So that will not be zero. But then, of course, you won't commute, so it's in there also. Yeah, I mean, then we will come to the Casimir's a little later. Huh? Yeah, a little later. Uh, but let me just complete this part. Uh, to this discussion of SU2 versus SO3. Hmm? Uh, and then the next step will be, which I will start today already, is the chapter, the next chapter, which is six. Uh, so I think it was just one part was left over from the chapter five, the Lie algebra of SO3. So, so we already saw, just to remind you, uh, and also to remind me where we were. Uh, so, so given uh, uh, the, so in a, in a given representation, so this was a joint representation. We're talking about a joint representation. And uh, so sigma A's, uh, sigma A's were, uh, there was a question. Right. So a joint action was defined like this. A joint G, a joint G, what is the notation? A joint G, right? Acting on a sigma A. Sigma A is one of the generators is nothing else but G inverse sigma A G inverse. Okay. But then we know that, again, this is an element of the Lie algebra. Therefore, it must be linear combination of the generators, right? And that's how we define this M A B. Yeah, we called it, we, uh, we wrote this as M A B. These are the linear combinations and the co constant coefficients uh, sigma uh, B. Some do, repeated indexes sum over. This is guaranteed because see, uh, the moment you know that this is an element of Lie algebra, then I can expand it in the basis, right? And the sigma b is provided a basis, so I can always expand it. And here, this index b is a sum over. A just refers to the fact that I'm on the left hand side there is an index a, so there must be an index here also a, a free index, right? And also it depends on g. And then we found rather very amazing property that M, so this can be viewed as a matrix, right? Um, it's a 3 by 3 matrix because A and B run over 1, 2, 3. So it's 3 by 3 matrix. And then what we saw was that M transpose G, or the same G, MG is equal to 1. Uh, 1, 1, yeah, I did it matrix. That will be zero one right? And furthermore, determinant of m is one. Uh, one thing I should also mention that these are real numbers. Why? Because uh, this is uh, sigma a is Hermitian. So the g inverse g, g inverse sigma a g is also Hermitian, right? And you are expanding a Hermitian matrix as linear combinations of the Hermitian matrices. So it will be real. These coefficients are real. So these are real matrices. Well, this is clear, right? This is, this is Hermitian because if I take the dagger of that, uh, so it will become G inverse, I take the dagger. 
but that's the same as G dagger, sigma A dagger, but sigma A dagger is sigma A, sigma poly matrices are efficient. Okay? And then you have a G inverse dagger. But G dagger, because it's a uh, unitary group, G, inver G dagger is the same as G inverse, and then sigma A, and G inverse dagger is sigma G. So you get back that, right? So it's a remission. Remission matrix, and I'm expanding. These are remission, so this must be real numbers. Okay. So these are exactly the conditions, uh, and, and n is real. These are exactly the conditions which define the SO3, SO3 arc. So that, that shows that uh, you, yeah, in the joint representation, these group elements are represented by matrices, which are SO3 matrices. Now, what about SO3? If you look at SO3, uh, again, so these are for the finite elements. And if you look at the Lie algebra of SO3, so near the, near the identity. Okay. So you write uh, the matrix M as identity plus some small, let's say, X. Hmm? Okay, we ignore order X squared. So we ignore that. Okay. And just look at the infinitesimal element here. Then, if you plug it in the defining equation, and transpose M equal to identity, you get the equation identity plus x transpose times identity plus x equal to 1 is equal to identity. Okay. Open it up and keep only linear terms. Okay. Then I, I, left, left hand side will be identity, this times that, plus x transpose plus x plus order x squared. So we don't care about that. So that's equal to identity. So this implies that x transpose is minus x. So x's are anti-symmetric matrices. Now how many anti-symmetric matrices, I mean what is the, how, how many, what's the dimension of such, such anti-symmetric matrices? It's a 3 by 3 matri anti-symmetric matrix. So the most general x I can write. Only three. <laughs> only three, three parameters. Only three parameters, right? Because uh, since anti-symmetric diagonals are zero, right? And then you can have A, B, C, all real numbers. And then here you have anti-symmetry transpose. This is minus A, minus B, minus C. Right? So you have three parameters, which is to be expected because SO3 is three-dimensional. Three the group is three-dimensional. There are three parameters. So indeed, you find there are three independent generators. And you can choose a basis. You can call the basis to be, uh, let's say, T1 is equal to 0, 0, uh, let me use the same notary convention. T, T, I think here we are calling J1, okay. Let's call it J1. J1 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0. That's one bit, uh, element. J2 is 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0. Minus one, uh, zero, zero. 0, 1, 0, 0, and J3 is 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, I mean, there's a, uh, it's convenient to use this notation because uh, you can see this, I mean, if I think of the first one as the first direction, second direction, third direction, then here, you see, this one doesn't change the first direction. When you apply, I mean, imagine that this is acting on zero. This uh, say J one is acting on a column vector, a three-dimensional column vector, x one, x two, x three. Okay. Then when I apply here, you see x one doesn't change. I mean, x one. This is the first variation, right? Remember, it's a one plus a j, right? So now we're looking at how much it transforms infinitesimally, right? So this doesn't transform, which means this remains the same, right? Whereas x two. Uh, x2, uh, so this will, when you apply that, what will you get? This will be 0. Uh, when you apply that, here x3 and minus x2. Okay. This is exactly the rotation in the 2 3 plane, right? A rotation uh, by infinitesimal amount. If I write this cos theta x2 plus uh, sin theta x3, 
or minus sin theta x3 and uh, x3, uh, sorry, sin theta x3, uh, no, sorry, cos theta x3, sin theta x2 plus cos theta x3, right? This is the ro rotation in the 2, 3 plane. And now look at the infinitesimal element, theta is, so just look at the first order. So that is the minus x3, okay, there's an overall minus sign, so we'll just put it like that, which means opposite, it's sort of counterclockwise, rotate clockwise, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if you do this, you get inf the first order variation theta. I mean, if you take a derivative respect to theta and set theta equal to zero, you find x3 here, and here you get minus x2. Right? So it's geometrically, it's just rotating in the 2, 3 plane. Whereas j2, you see uh, x2 will remain unchanged. If you apply again on that, x2 will remain unchanged. Right? And you just have a rotation in a 1, 3 plane. And same thing here, x3 will remain unchanged, and there's a rotation in the two, three plane, uh, one, two plane. Okay. So these are really a geometric meaning of rotations. Okay. Now, let's look at the commutation relations between this. So uh, if I've called it J1, J2, J3. So if I look at the commutation relation, J1, J2, then uh, you get, uh, uh, what do you get? Let me, I, I'm not sure what the plus or minus sign is. Uh, it's written here, it's minus J3. Okay. More generally, if I take A, B, C, okay, then this is epsilon A, B, C, J, C. Please check that. And there, by the way, I should also mention that there are lots of typos here. I mean, not a lot, but some typos. So it could be that there are some mistakes. So if you go through it, you will discover it. And uh, uh, please uh, put a circle and show it to me. Yeah? Because then the, maybe in the next version, we can correct the typos. Okay. Next year's version. So there could be typos, but not essential typos. I mean, you know, the, this kind of little things. Anyway, these signs uh, you can change by changing the multiplying everything by minus. So, it's not, not, not important. Uh, uh, okay, but this is like almost the same as the SU two. So this is the uh, these are the commutation relation for these J's. But remember, for the SU two, you had sigma a, sigma b uh, was equal to what was our two i right? Two i epsilon a b c. 2i epsilon a b c uh, sigma c. Right. So uh, you can see that the two commutation relations go to each other if you take j a to be uh, maybe sigma. I'm not sure. We can check that. Maybe sigma sig uh, sigma a over two, of course. But maybe there's an i here. Now I don't know whether it's plus i or minus i. You can check that. I mean, we can just check it, right? I mean, uh, if you plug this here, so you'll get here i sigma, I mean, plug it in here, this relation, i sigma b by 2, and uh, that's equal to, question is, what is that? So i, i squared is minus, and sigma a sigma b, and there's a 1 fourth here, 1 fourth, and then 2i uh, epsilon a b c sigma c. So what I did is okay. I square. I mean, these are numbers. I can take them out. So I square is minus two times two is one fourth here, and then I just use this uh, commutation relation sigma a sigma b is two i epsilon a b c sigma c. Okay. Now uh, this object. So this was the J A uh, J A J B. If 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 it is this one, we don't know yet. There's a question mark here. I may be missing some sign here. We will fix the sign. Uh, okay. So, but now, uh, if you look at the sigma c, i sigma c over 2 is jc. So, this is the same as minus uh, uh, this two, 2, 4 cancels, you get 1 half, right? So, minus jc, minus epsilon a b c, jc, which is indeed exactly that. Okay, the dimensions. This is two by two matrix, and this is three by three. Yeah, yeah. But this is a map. I'm just uh, saying that 
obviously this is not correct this is what you're right this is not correct but i'm saying that you can uh, let's say if i replace j a by i sigma a by 2 in this equation you get exactly so i mean this these two things matter this is a homomorphism of the group exactly the algebra precisely it's a map from the uh, so3 the algebra to su2 the algebra or vice versa it's not, it's not the same as when we're doing uh, g inverse times sigma times j. Yeah, yeah, it will be the same. It will be the same. So uh, this, uh, exactly. the result is j. Yeah, for sigma. exactly. So in other words, I mean, we had this m. We had this m of g. Right? Uh, but now take, uh, this was a finite element, finite group element, right? But now we are interested in the uh, Lie algebra, infinitesimal. So write g as, I don't know, 1 plus... Uh, 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 e to the power of i sigma 3 by 2 for sigma e, for example. Okay. Then you will find, uh, and uh, then you uh, write down, of course, uh, let's say put here theta, and take the infinitesimal one, theta goes to 0, first derivative. So here, you will find that this will be identity matrix plus J3. That's what this is saying. Okay. This, this map is saying that. That in fact, uh, this is a 3 by 3 matrix. Right? G is of course two by two matrix, but we have a general formula for a general formula meaning that we know how to determine this, right? Mg. Okay. So now plug that in here. Then the claim is that this will be equal to one plus J three plus higher orders plus order theta square. So it will be theta J three. But wasn't G arbitrary? Any element from? No, no. So I'm taking this particular basis now. J one, J two, J three. No, you mean G or J? G. No, so G is yeah, G is arbitrary, but now I want to uh, relate, make a relation between the Lie algebras, the two Lie algebras. So uh, in general, you can choose any G or uh, to create a joint representation, but uh, to make a, a good-looking new Lie uh, algebra, we choose a particular uh, G so that it makes the. No, okay, so it's more more general. I mean, you see that M of G. Uh, is an adjoint representation of the of G, right? But uh, if I now look at an element which is very close to identity, so theta is very small. Well, M of identity, identity element in the G, will be of course identity matrix because it doesn't it doesn't it does nothing, right? Because remember the relation was M of G, uh, M no, sorry, G inverse sigma G, sigma A G was M A B uh, sigma B, right? So if you take G equal to what identity, then sigma A goes to sigma A. So M A B is simply delta A B, right? So if, if M of identity is identity matrix. No? Okay, now look at something which is close to identity, so a small theta. It is going to be something close to identity as a three by, so the, I will distinguish here, right? This is a three by three matrix, uh, identity matrix. This was two by two identity matrix, right? Because G is a two by two. But now if I look at nearby points, so this will be like 1 plus i, uh, 1 plus x, let's say, x x is some Lie algebra generator, right? So 1 plus x, then this is also going to be something small, close to identity, right? That will be again some infinitesimal element. So that will be the SO3 Lie algebra. So this is, gives you a natural map between the SU2 Lie algebra and SO3 Lie algebra. And now what I'm saying is that the map is exactly this, which you can see from here. Okay. That map is this map. Either this way or that way. Okay. So if you take the i sigma a by 2 is mapped to j a, if you do this. Okay. That, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's not difficult to see. Just uh, plug that in here. g is uh, now 1 plus, say, i sigma a by 2. I sigma, uh, say 3 by 2, I sigma 3 by 2. Look at the commutator. I will look at uh, first order expansion. Okay? And then you will find, you can construct the matrix MAB. Right? Is it correct? I mean, I'm saying that, uh, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should go a little bit too. So, uh, this is the general relation. This is a finite group element. Now, let's take G itself to be uh, something like identity plus some theta times X. X could be any combination of sigmas. Uh, so this I uh, take to be G. Okay. Then what is G inverse? G inverse 
is identity minus theta x right? to the first order. To this order, it will be that. And I'm, as I said, I'm always ignoring theta squared. Right? Okay. So this order will be that. Now plug that in here. So you will get here 1 minus, one minus uh, theta c x times uh, sigma a uh, times 1 plus theta x uh, equal to whatever m, uh, m of, let's say, let me now call it x, huh? because g is completely determined by x in that neighborhood. Uh, m of x, uh, sigma b, uh, a b, sigma b. Okay? That's the relation. So I want to find out now, so what, let's open this up, and again, keep, so this is uh, m of theta x, huh? m of theta x, theta m to keep in there. Oh, let, let me just write, leave it like that. So it's m of identity plus theta x, right? This is g. Now let's uh, expand it to the first order in theta. So the first term, identity, identity, just gives me sigma a. And then to the first order in theta, you get here minus theta, uh, the commutator of x sigma a. Right? And that, on the right hand side, it will be the first, uh, I mean, when theta is 0, m of identity, you already saw is identity. Okay. So you will just get back the sigma a. I mean, identity means delta a b. Delta a b times, so that will be the same. And then the next term, will be some theta times some matrix m, 3 by 3 matrix, which now depends on which x you are talking about, right? a, b, sigma, b. And now you can construct exactly, right? Uh, so just compare this, this cancels. And to the first order in theta, we are saying that uh, x computed with sigma a is the same as minus m x a, b, sigma, b. So then you can determine, I mean, x you can choose to be, I mean, for any sigma, x is anyway, expand, you can expand x in terms of i sigma, i sigma. So you can put that there and you can construct, for example, what is the, uh, if I take x equal to i sigma 3 by 2, let's say, what, what will you get here? We can check that. If I take, yeah, let's just check that. So suppose, x is i sigma 3 by 2. Hmm? Then uh, left hand side will give me i sigma 3 sigma a committed by 2. But this is 2i epsilon 3 a b sigma b. Okay? So this is, so i by 2 times 2i epsilon 3 a b sigma b. So 2, 2 cancels, i, i makes it minus. So you get here minus epsilon 3 a, b, sigma b. Okay. Now what is, as a matrix, what is epsilon 3 a, b? So let's write down. So uh, 3, uh, 1, 2 can be non-zero, right? So 1, 2 is plus 1, but that makes it minus 1, minus 1. And then uh, 0 is, uh, so, uh, sorry, 3 a, b. So 3, 1, 2, correct, so it's a minus 1. 0, 1, 1 will be 0, of course, it's totally it's anti symmetric So this side 0. So that is that. Now, uh, if you take uh, 3, 1, 3, it is 0. Right? Whenever the, one of these indices is 0, uh, 3, it is 0. So this is 0, and this is 0, this is 0. And now if it's take uh, 2, 1, it will be plus, uh, minus 1, minus, minus, plus. That's what it is. But this is what we are calling as minus j3, I think, right? This is why the previous difference minus j3. So what we are saying is m, m of uh, uh, sigma 3, i sigma 3 by 2, is the same as j3. Right? Now this linear, so I can take out i by 2. So, so that's what I'm saying. So that's the map. J, J A is mapped to I sigma A by 2. Mm -hmm. yeah. But 
in fact, you are free to choose any basis to write those generated matrices, but if you choose G to be that particular one, we can have yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And the same way also for the SO3, you could have chosen any basis. Any basis, right? We just chose G1, G2. You could also two. choose a new basis for other than thousand matrices for SO2. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. It is some Hermitian, I mean, polymetrics will be some two by two traces Hermitian matrix. So let's choose something else. Yeah. Sure. But then, whatever you, uh, ch the choice of basis you make here, there will be a corresponding choice of basis there. So, that's Yeah, yeah, with that definition. So, this is the basically the map. I mean, at least in, in this basis, the standard polymetrics and this J1, J2, J3, which have the interpretation of rotations around these three, on the three planes. Hmm? Uh, that was the identification, and this, uh, this is the map. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, yeah, this, this, in fact, what we said is, uh, is, uh, yeah, uh, this J, J C is exactly, exactly. J C is exactly M of uh, I sigma A by two. So this again, this is, should be understood as map two. Huh? Uh, equality was not correct. So M of I sigma A by two, uh, and M of I sigma B by two, commutator. Right? But then the representation had to satisfy a very important property that the commutation relations, the, the Lie Al bracket is preserved. Right? So that is the, exactly what it is. So this is the same as M of the commutator I sigma A by 2, I sigma B by 2. Exactly. And that is uh, this guy. And then M of that is JC. So this is uh, this is not equality. Equality was erroneous. No? It was just a map. Or equality would be here. If you use this, this will be equal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so that uh, and then now with this identification, you can now again uh, see this phenomenon of uh, this uh, cow, the two to one map. Okay. So for example, let's suppose. I, I want to make a rotation uh, in the, in the three-dimensional representation by uh, 2 pi, okay. or by theta, by some, some theta. Let's say. So I want to make a rotation uh, by theta. But now I'm not going to do a fi uh, infinitesimal, a finite rotation. Okay. So I can take it to be a, a exponential theta j3. In the three-dimensional, this is a, th a joint representation of the SU2 or you know, the defining representation. But what is J3? We said J3 was 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, this is J3. And you can see some nice property. Uh, J3 square is just 1, 1, 0. Okay. I mean, actually, you could have done it more easily. But uh, uh, OK, let, let's just uh, do this out. Uh, J3 square and J3 cube. J3 cube is nothing else but J3 again. Okay. So an exponential um, again, just like what we did for SU2. You remember we expanded the exponential and used the properties like sim some similar to these properties, right? and then we could group them into two different series. And uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so now uh, you can uh, group it. So in general, if I take e to the power of theta j3, then this is going to be uh, theta to the n, which again, let's split into e1 and odd terms, factorial to n, uh, j3 to the n, uh, plus, plus theta to the 2n plus 1, over 2n plus 1 factorial, J3 to the 
2 and so on. J3 to the 2 and plus 1. Right? That's exponential. So summed over n from 0 to infinity. Now, uh, use the fact that all the odd powers, I mean, J3, J3 cube is J3, J3 to the 5 is again J3, and so on and so forth. So all of these guys will be just J3. Right? So this, uh, so this is simply become J3. And this sum uh, just gives me, uh, by, sorry, is it? No, 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 J3 squared is minus 1. Sorry. If I take the J3 squared, it's minus, minus, minus. Because if I take the square, just multiply this, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. You multiply that, you, this will get a minus 1 here. So there's a minus here, minus here. So here it's minus. Okay. So that means uh, uh, when you do this here, you're going to get a minus 1 to the n times j3. Okay. I mean, is that clear? So for n equal to 1, this is j3 cube. But j3 cube is minus j3. So you have a, for n equal to 1, there's a minus sign. But if you take n equal to 2, this is j3 to the 5. But j3 to the 5 is the same as minus j3 cube, which is the same as j3. Just use it twice, this relation. So you get that. So, so you can see that whenever, yeah, whenever uh, n is odd, you pick up a minus sign. And whenever n is e1, you don't pick up a sign. It stays plus. That's the reason for that. The same thing you can do here. So here it would be, um, uh, so what is this object? So yeah, let me just call it J3 square. So you get here, the n equal to 0 term will be the full identity matrix. Yeah. And matrix to the 0 power is identity, right? N yeah, it's uh, by definition, that's. Exactly. I mean that. I mean normally I would have just written as one plus, one plus, you know, theta j three, plus and so on and so forth, right? But I just grouped in this notation. I I mean n equal to zero. Otherwise I have to write separately the n equal to zero term. Okay. And then uh, if you look at the theta square term, so theta square term. Uh, so then what you get is minus one. No, you get one one zero. Okay. And you'll get here minus 1 to the n, theta to the 2n, 2n factorial. That is why, because uh, you see j3 square is minus minus, j3 to the 4 would be plus 1, plus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on, right? Because I just take the square of that, they become plus, plus. So there's alternate minus signs and plus signs. So so j square, j3 square gives you j3 square, n equal to 1, you get a minus sign, n equal to 2, you get a plus sign, and so on and so forth. So, so this is, you can rewrite that as, okay, uh, you have a 0, 0, I, 1. From here, I rewrite that as this plus that, right? Plus 1, 1, 0 times cosine theta. Okay. And from here, the last term, where was it last term? Oh, uh, I erased that part, is it? Theta to the 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. That was the one coming from here. And from the, that part, we get, this is nothing else but sine theta. Uh, so minus sine theta, actually, because n equal to 1. Is that, so um, no, sorry, n is here going from 0. n is going from 0 to infinity. Okay. So it's plus sine theta uh, times uh, or minus I think minus sine theta times j3. Yeah. Is that correct? Maybe I'm making some mistake in the signs. Is it correct? So here we started with that. The sum is going both for both terms n equal, n equal to zero, n equal to zero to infinity. And uh, here for n equal to zero, you just get theta j3. Uh, uh, theta times j3. Uh, then n equal to 3, we are saying you pick up a minus sign. So so there is a minus sign, right? Is that correct? I mean, so n equal to 0 is simply theta j3. Uh, n equal to minus, n equal to 1 is 3, so it's a plus sign. n equal to, yeah, 
Is, is that sign correct? I mean, and maybe okay. That's a matter of plus or minus. You can you can check it. Is this plus or minus? That's a basically orientation, clockwise or counterclockwise. So if you combine all of that, uh, you see you get uh, exactly uh, this expression. Uh, I mean the, that object uh, cosine theta, uh, sine theta, the plus sine theta or minus sine theta depends on. You have, to, you have to carefully check. I just leave that as an exercise. <laughs> just carefully check that. So plus or minus sine theta. And here it'll be minus or plus sine theta, uh, cosine theta, 0, 0, 0, 0, identity, and 1. Because yeah. remember, what is J3? J3 is, was that? 0, 1, zero, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the, load, the third component remains 1. Nothing happens to that. And this two part, this two by two part here, this two by two part here is simply cos theta here and sin, sin theta, plus or minus sin theta here. Right? So you get this. That's exactly what we said about the rotation. Right? So we are just rotating in the one two plane. So the axis of rotation is three, third direction, and we are just rotating the one two plane by an angle theta. Okay. Now here you notice, if theta goes to 2 pi, this becomes identity, right? Theta equal to 2 pi rotation, you do nothing. You just come back to itself. On the other hand, you see, this was a representation of this object, M of G, right? Uh, where was it? Yeah, all of these things we are writing, theta, theta of J3, but J, this was a representation of M, because remember the uh, M of I sigma 3 by 2 was J3. So this is nothing else but the exponential of M theta times M of J3, uh, of uh, I sigma 3 by 2. Right? This is the same as M of X theta I sigma 3 by 2, e to the power of I sigma 3 by 2. So what we see is that this matrix, this matrix, at the, as theta goes to 2 pi, becomes identity. On the other hand, if you look at this object, this is the SU2 group element, theta equal to 2 pi is e to the power of, this is at theta equal to 2 pi, is e to the power of i pi sigma 3, which is not identity. It is actually minus identity. This matrix is minus 1, minus 1. 0, 0. So what we are seeing, is what you saw already before, that theta equal to 0, of course, theta equal to 0, theta equal to 0 is the identity matrix here. Okay. So identity matrix theta equal to 0 is mapped to the identity in the SO3, but also this element is mapped. So this is again, we have seen it already before, but I'm just showing it in this language now. Uh, 2 to 1 map. So the G and minus G are mapped to the same element, which is all one is saying. Yeah. Excuse me. During the equation 1 plus minus 1 to the N, the, the line. Uh, which one? Sorry, here, here. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, the identity, was, uh, uh, how does the uh, identity appear in the last line? Because here, the identity was decomposed to two parts. Ah, because this one, uh, you see, here I've taken out, so this sum is N equal to 1 to infinity. Because I took out the n equal to 0 term, oh. right? So n equal to 1 term is uh, not give you cos cosine theta, right? I mean, you, you need also this term. You, I mean, in order, you need this term to make it starting from n equal to 0 to infinity, right? So adding this term to that, then you get, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Maybe I'm being a bit sloppy today. Let's see, let just write it more clearly. So uh, this sum, the originally it was n equal to 0 to infinity here, n equal to 0 to infinity there. This one, I took out the n equal to 0 term. So this is 1. Now here, the remaining sum is n equal to 1 to infinity. And this term becomes cosine theta. Uh, not, uh, not cosine theta. Uh, this is not cosine theta. This is uh, so, uh, cosine theta would have been starting from n equal to 0. right? So the n equal to 0 term is precisely that, the extra piece from identity. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, so this identity, so maybe I should do it in two steps. So the first identity, I write it as 0, 0, 1, everything is 0 here, plus uh, 1, 1, 0. And then I have still the sum n equal to 1 to infinity of uh, minus 1 to the n, theta to the 2n, uh, over factorial 2n, times the same matrix, 1, 1, 0. Zero, zero, zero. Okay. I mean, this is, uh, I don't know. Okay. It's the same matrix. So I can take out this matrix as a common factor. And what will be, you'll get also, uh, so if I take this matrix out, then you'll get 1 plus n equal to 1 to infinity minus 1 to the n, theta to the 2n, 2n factorial. Okay. Okay. And this 1, when you add it, it just makes yeah. it from n equal to 0, which is what is cosine theta. Yeah. And the odd guys is fine. Odd, odd ones were already fine. So that directly gave you sine theta. Okay. So, oh, sorry, so much time. Hmm. Huh? Now, <clears throat> all right. Any question here? In, uh, yeah. You said that uh, if it's two elements in S, you do have to be one single element. It is for the group elements, uh, but in the algebra is the it's a one to one. one, to one. We are sure. Yeah, that's one to one. Right? The, yeah, that, that's one. I mean, yeah, you can uh, you can see that. I mean, they explicitly for the map that we have given, uh, the J three. What was the map? J three. For, for the given basis, huh? like, for the given basis vectors, so to say, how the matches. Yeah. They are one by one mapped. Yeah. Does it also mean that every vector? It's is a vector, vector space. Linear yeah. vector space, right? So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, this is, uh, is it, yeah, exactly. But it's not hard to see because after all, uh, I mean, if you look at the picture, you let's look at that. So SU2 is some sphere, right? Uh, a three sphere, S, S2, SU2 is S3. And let's suppose the identity is the, I call a point, point this here, identity here. Identity element, uh, north pole, so just call it north pole of this. It's a three dimensional sphere. You cannot picture it, you cannot draw it. But anyway, just imagine. Huh? But then, uh, this is mapped to uh, SO3, which is uh, not really, a, a, obviously it's not S3, it's S3 modded by Z2, okay? It's not S3 exactly. But there also, uh, some space, if some space, I mean, not really fine space. white spaces. Hmm? It's a projective plane? Uh, no, it's just, uh, I mean, opposite, uh, opposite, po opposite points are identified. That's yeah, that's a projective plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can it, yeah. So, so here, uh, so suppose the identity is somewhere. Identity is some somewhere here. Okay. Now what we are seeing is that this one and minus one, these two points are mapped to the same identity here. Okay, there's some space, SO3 space, where identity is one particular element. Okay. Uh, that is identity. Both these points are mapped there. Okay. But here we are talking about the infinitesimal, so it is some in this region. Okay. That is nothing to that doesn't see this at all, it's far away. So this region will be mapped there. Of course, a region here will also be mapped there. But uh, as far as Lie algebra is concerned, there is no, I mean, it's a one-to-one. -one. And the left-hand side is really S3. Uh, it's like when we make a two-pi rotation, we end up at the same point, or when we make Which one, sorry, the SU2? SU2, yes. SU2 is S3, that's what you saw. Uh, but does it? Uh, two pi rotation or four pi rotation brings us to the beginning point. Uh, four pi, four, four pi, yeah. for the left yeah. hand. Well, when I say SC, you, you remember the, the complex coordinates Z1, Z2, Z1 bar, Z2 bar. You saw that the determinant equal to one condition was Z1 Z mod square plus Z2 mod square is equal to one. And that already immediately tells us what is this. But I, I'm not even parameterizing it because theta and so on. Uh, if we were to parameterize, it will be four pi. Four pi, yeah. four pi exactly. I mean, uh, uh, in, in this language, right, because uh, now we are using v to the power of i theta, say i sigma by 2 theta, right? There is a the 1 by 2 then. In the map j3 to sigma 3, there was a map j3 goes to sigma 3 by i sigma 3 by 2. That is why. So in this, in this notation, then of course there should be 4 pi. So actually, when you go from 
one bound minus pi, you rotate two pi in the SU2 uh, sphere. Well, that, that depends on your coordinates. I mean, if there, I mean, we were not putting a 2 there, right? In that case, it will be just 2 pi. I mean, if I didn't put a 2 there, then it, this would be 2 pi will be identity. Right? But pi e to the i pi sigma 3 would be the minus identity. Okay? So the, this other pole would be pi. Right? But the point is that here in the map j3 to sigma 3, there was a half here. So I multiply and divide by 2. Right? So in this language, and the, what is the coefficient of this guy? That is 2 pi, which gives you minus. And if I do the same thing here, it will be 4 pi. Okay. So it was a relation between the, what was important was here, the relation between J3 and sigma 3. There was a factor of half there, which is what. If J3 was sigma 3, then it wouldn't be the case, right? And J3 was mapped to sigma 3, then it wouldn't be the case. But here, no, J3 is not mapped to sigma 3, sigma 3 by 2. It's like we have two kinds of parameters. An original parameter theta mapped to the half of the, of yeah. the theta prime. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that map was determined by looking at the commutation relation. You see, it was crucial. Because with the J, the commutation relation was JA, JB was uh, epsilon or minus, plus or minus, and epsilon ABC, JC. There was no factor of 2 here. Okay. Whereas sigma A, sigma B had this factor of 2. 2I two epsilon ABC, sigma C. Right? It is this reason. Is this factor of two which is responsible for that? So in the map between J and sigmas, you had an extra one, one half factor for the sigma. No, that is what we know the difference. Okay. So now, uh, if you don't have any more questions, I will uh, go to I um, will go to the uh, representation of SU two. Right. And this is really, I will go very slowly, and uh, maybe it, it will take, uh, all, you have seen it of course, and you have seen it perhaps in a different language. I'm sure you have all done uh, uh, harmonic, I mean the hydrogen atom, you know, and uh, three-dimensional harmonic oscillators, where you have the SO3 group, you know, uh, SO3 group, and that is what, I mean, probably you have seen it in terms of differential operators and eigenfunctions, no? When you construct the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, you use spherical harmonics. Right? So you have probably seen in that language. But maybe some of you have also seen in the language that I'll be presenting. But in any case, uh, it will not be the language of spherical harmonics. It will be a different language. Yeah? It will not be different show operators. It will be purely algebraic, okay? the language I'll present. Um, uh, but uh, the, the final result is the same. Okay. But this is crucial to understand very well. I mean, really, you have to understand this inside out. Okay? Uh, because uh, if you understand that, you can understand other uh, more complicated algebras. Because you'll see that all the more complicated algebras, like SU3, all the other ones, you can, you can, what happens, the way you study SU3, etc., is by looking at various SU2 subalgebras. It'll have various different SU2 subalgebras. Okay? And if you understand SU2 very well, then you can understand all the other algebras. Okay? By just uh, taking various SU2 subalgebras and using the properties that you already know of the SU2 representations. So this is why it's very crucial. These next two, three lectures, uh, uh, which are, are very simple since you have already done it, but please pay attention to it because this is really the crucial thing. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so representation we have already defined. Okay. Uh, so it was just a map from the uh, Lie algebra or the group uh, to a set of matrices. We satisfy either the, for the Lie algebra, it will satisfy the Lie bracket, it will preserve the Lie bracket, or if it is a, a map from the group to the matrices, then it will preserve the group product law. So that, that is the, that is the definition. And in fact, what we saw just now was a joint representation, a particular representation, a joint representation. Now we'll consider the most general, finite dimensional representation of uh, SUG. Okay. 
So the representation was defined as an, a linear map uh, from algebra. Let's say. From linear, uh, or let, let's first define the group again and repeating it. From the group to is a map uh, from group to the set of matrices, say a set of say n by n matrices. N is some fixed, but n can be arbitrary. You know, it doesn't have to be two or three or four. It could be arbitrary. But some, uh, uh, but you fix it. Once you fix it, you fix it. Set n by n matrices. Okay. Uh, in such a way that the group composition rule, group composition, or group product rule, is preserved. Which means if if I have G one and G two belonging to G, then uh, let's say say the map is R. Ah, uh, no, don't put a real number. Uh, this is just the matrices R. So R of G one times R of G two is the same as R of G one times G two. Or uh, so this was for the group. Uh, similarly, the same, and you can define it for the Lie algebra. So the Lie algebra is again a map from the Lie algebra to the set of matrices. Same thing, and cross n matrices, which is first of all linear, linear map. So this is a linear map. Okay. So what does that, that linear means? If I have x and y belonging to G. Then x plus y, of course, also belongs to G, or any number a x plus b y also belongs to G. Okay. A and b can be either real or complex, depending on whether you have a real or you can. Com Many times we will see that uh, in discussing a representation, particularly for higher Lie algebras, we need to go to the complexification of the Lie algebra okay. because uh, that requires uh, finding eigenvalues, and when you discuss eigenvalues. The eigenvalues can be complex. You know, you have to go to the complex matrices. So, but uh, for the moment, uh, okay, let's just keep that. So, A and B are either real numbers or complex numbers, depending on the situation. And these are mapped. So that that means the, 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 when I say linear, it means the following: R of A X plus B Y is the same as A R of X plus B R of Y. So R is a map. So what's, what's the difference between G and curly G? Ah, I said that last time. So I just to distinguish, whenever I use a curly, it means a Lie algebra. Okay. Lie algebra of that group. So this is a Lie algebra. It's just not to confuse I mean, the two things. When you see such a letter, then you know it's a group. When you see such a curly thing, it means uh, Lie algebra. Lie algebra, and that is a group. Okay, that's one thing. But more importantly, it is that the Lie bracket should be preserved. So, uh, so the Lie bracket, the Lie bracket, must be preserved. Which means uh, R of uh, R of x comma y, the bracket, which is again an element of the Lie algebra. Right? That's the same as the commutator of Rx R with Ry. Right? So uh, I, I forgot to mention here again, when I say the composition rule, here the composition rule is a standard, these are our matrices, n by n matrix, n by n matrix. So on the left hand side, this product rule is simply the matrix multiplication. Okay? The same thing here, when I talk about the commutator of these two guys, it is just with respect to the matrix. usual matrix commutator. So this is the this are the uh, this is the if you can find such a map that satisfies these conditions, you say it's a representation of the Lie algebra or the group. Now from now on we'll be focusing on the Lie algebra. Huh? Okay, so this is so this means a representation of the Lie algebra. Yeah. So the algebraic notations does not respect the Lie algebra but uh, respect the group, right? No, no. If, if it respects the group, then it will auto automatically respect the Lie algebra. Because you just have to, since you have the full, full group, you can just restrict to the infinitism elements. Then from there, all these properties will come. It's not that there are new properties. These are coming from there.
because I mean the uh, linear structure is clear because uh, I mean uh, the, uh, you just focus on the infinitesimal elements. Infinite elements satisfy uh, they are in the vector space. So this composition rule already gives you the vector space structure, right? Meaning, say g1 is say e to the x1, or some with small parameter say a x1, uh, and g2 is e to the uh, say b x2. Then, uh, if I write it as 1 plus ax1 plus higher orders, and here I write it as i1 plus identity, mm -hmm. plus uh, bx2 plus dot dot dot, then you see that uh, this composition rule g1 times g2 is going to be identity plus ax1 plus bx2 plus higher orders. Right? So, this composition rule already tells you that. No? Uh, when I mean, this will go over to that relation. Okay. And the commutator is simply uh, taking these two and keeping also the order A times B. Okay. I mean, here we ignored all the quadratic terms. But now if you keep A, B order, okay, then you will get this term. Commuter. So that's, uh, so it's all contained. I mean, it's not uh, something new. Uh, yeah, it's all the consequence of that. But it's just that it's easier to study the Lie algebra because there's a vector space structure, and we are more familiar with the vector space. We are more, uh, we can think more easily about the vector space. And once you have that, then you can exponentiate it back to get the group elements, at least the group elements which are connected to the identity, not not uh, not uh, some element which is not connected to the identity, but all the elements which are connected to the identity, smooth, connect, uh, continuously. You can arrive there by exponentiation. Okay, now, yeah. Uh, but, you know, not uh, all the representations are what is called irreducible. So let me just define what is irreducible and reducible. Uh, so generally, so let's take uh, the level of Lie algebra. So I have uh, some R of x is an n by n matrix. So it will be, I don't know, the various entries here. So n cross n matrices. But suppose, that it is possible to choose, so this n, n of them here and there. That uh, suppose, uh, so this of course you can think of it as some kind of a transformation acting on some n dimensional vector space. Right? And whenever you have n by n matrix, you can multiply this to an n column vector, and then you can think of this as a transformation on that space. Now, if, if there exists some changes of basis of these vector spaces in such a way that this can be block diagonalized. Okay. So, so if there exists some matrix, let's say S, such that S inverse R X S. Okay, this is what is the change of basis, right? So I'm talking about S inverse means. So we are saying that S inverse exists, which means determinant of S is not zero, right? So S acting on a basis. If I choose some basis for n-dimensional vector, these are n by n matrices. Uh, if determinant is not equal to zero, then this S acting on the basis can be thought of as a transformation of basis, going to a new basis. Okay, and then if you apply the same transformation on the on the row vector, okay, that's going to give me S inverse, or not row vector. Right, row vector. I change the basis, then. If I want to express the old basis in terms of the new basis here, I'll have to write, multiply by S inverse. So this is just rewriting the, that guy in terms of some new basis. This is not going to change anything. You see, this is not going to change any of these properties, right? If I look at the S inverse S here, again, anyway, this is linear, so nothing happens to this relation. Just multiply both sides by S inverse and S. S inverse S, S inverse S, S inverse S. This little AB are numbers, so nothing happens. And here also, so you'll have a, if I multiply this by S inverse and S on the right, here also S inverse and S, but that's okay. I mean, this, so there's two terms here, Rx, Ry, minus Ry, Rx, sandwiched between S inverse and S. But in each of these product things, I can insert an S inverse times S, I mean S times S inverse, okay? So you see, it will just become the commutator of the new R. So that's just change your base, nothing, nothing fundamental about it. In fact, you say that the two representations are equivalent to each other if there is a change of basis which takes you from one to the other. Okay. 
but there's no new physics. I mean, it's the same. You just you know, somebody chooses one basis, another person chooses another basis. For all the elements of the Lie group of the Lie algebra. algebra. Same thing will work for also Lie, Lie groups. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Again, you see this this rule also will not change if I multiply by S and S inverse both sides. So because this is usual matrix multiplication, right? So S S inverse can insert here. So th this is all fine. But now the statement is that it could happen that, uh, I mean, to begin with, the Rx, this n by n matrices are all, none of these uh, elements are zero in general, because I have to do it for all Xs, all the Lie algebra, right? X is just one particular element of the Lie algebra. But what now we are saying is that if there exists a, a, a change of basis, this S should not depend on X, because once you have changed the basis, you have changed the basis. Then, if it happens that for all x, this matrix, this this matrix is block diagonal, okay? then you say this this representation is reducible. Okay? You can reduce it to smaller representations. Okay? So, sorry, let me just uh, read for the same thing. I mean, the reason for doing all, saying all this is that, uh, so that we can simplify our problem of classifying all the representations. Yeah. Okay, so, so if there exists, if there exists S such that S inverse Rx S is block diagonal, For all x's, for all x's, for all x belonging to G. Okay. So what do I mean by block diagonal? The original matrices were n by n, but what we are saying there is some I can split into blocks. Let's say n one and n two. Of course, sum is n one plus n two equal to n. N one plus n two is one. Uh, and uh, the block diagonal means this part is all zero. Here can be anything. Here can be anything, but this part is zero. Okay, that, that's what I mean by block diagonal. If that happens, then you say, then you then you say that this representation then R is reducible. Okay. I mean, if you think about it, what it means? It it means. Uh, in terms of if I apply it on the vector space here, if I started with some vector which is zero here and something non-zero here, let's say one, okay. zero, zero. Then when I apply this R of x, it thinks all the R of x, I mean after, after the transform the R of x is block diagonal, mm -hmm. zero here. This uh, this can only move between this space, right? Mm -hmm. Because only this part will see that. So the x, the entire Lie algebra will, can move this this vector to only this subspace, not the everywhere. Okay. So it, that's why it's called reducible. I mean, this big space I can reduce it to smaller spaces, where each of this space is closed, invariant under the action of the Lie algebra. Because no matter what x you choose, they are bound to be of this form, right? By the definition of reducible, right? that we are saying should, is block diagonal. Then for any x I apply, this is going to stay here. It will never go there, okay? And vice versa. If you started with something, everything zero here, and say one, zero, 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 everything, then I apply, uh, this, only these are going to act on that. And so this is only going to stay here. So these two spaces, you see, don't mix under the, yeah, or if, like in, in the sense of, say for example, rotation, right? Uh, SO3 or SO2 that we said, we're saying that there are, take, take an example, I mean, let's say um, we know of two representations of SU2, right? The defining representation, which is two by two poly matrices, and we also know three by three representation, SO3, which we discussed just now. Now I can construct a five dimensional representation, which is of the following type. Here, uh, so uh, um, X, X is of SU2, so x is uh, basically x a sigma a, right? 
summed over a. So in SU2, two, two by two matrices. So this is two by two. Here is zero, zero. And here I just take the m of x, the m of x, the a three by three matrices, which we defined just now. So I take this. I get a five dimensional representation. This is two dimensional, I mean two by two, this is three by three. So this is five dimensional representation. Okay. But this is reducible. Okay. Because uh, things, uh, what, what are here is, is just transformed between them, this two dimensional space. This two dimensional space is invariant, subspace is invariant, and this three dimensional subspace is invariant. Okay. And we don't learn anything new. If I already know all the properties of these two, individually, then it's not that I'm going to learn anything new by considering this representation. No? But that's why. So what they're trying to say is that it is enough to study irre irreducible is opposite of that. Reducible. irreducible representation is the one which cannot be brought into this form, cannot be brought into block diagram form. Right? So what we are uh, arguing here is that it is enough to study irreducible representations. Because if you know irreducible representation, you can put them together to get any re any other representation. Okay. That, that doesn't, doesn't seem that doesn't this seem like the reducible representations are uh, tensor product of the reducible ones? Because in tensor product of matrices or in general vector spaces, every, t every for example, if we have operators yes. on vector spaces and we take the tensor product, every operator acts on the elements which are related to him only. That's uh, the same case uh, which yeah. you do here. I would say direct sum of the vector spaces. The now, tensor product will be dimensionally multiplied, right? Yeah. So if it was like uh, this is 2 and 3, right? Tensor product will be 2 times 3, 6. In other words, tensor, uh, a vector of the tensor product will have two labels, let's say i and a. So i is this in this label, and that is 3, right? Mm. So this, one, uh, what, this is goes 1, 2, that goes 1, 2, 3. So six dimensional tensor product, right? But here's a, just a direct sum. Uh, when you add the direct sum of two vector spaces, is a dimension is additive. Yeah. There is a direct sum. Now we know two and three dimensional representations yeah. for this particular yeah. algebra. We can construct any two n plus three n dimensional representations by the same yeah. trick. Two n plus three n, yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, but what if uh, there were, there is a number that uh, cannot be defined as uh, some of the basic representations? Yeah, yeah. No, no, so of course I'm not claiming that this is all the representation. What I'm saying is that I don't need to study this. Because this is, uh, if I, I, since I already now know, you know, now everything about the two dimensional representation and three dimensional representation. So, of course, you can construct such representations as you say, 2n plus 3n, right? Where there are lots of blocks, n doublets and n triplets, no? But uh, I mean, you, there's nothing new to learn about that because we already learned it about two dimensional representation and three dimensional representation. Yes. Uh, but in this case, is there any other five dimensional representation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's where we're going to come to that. I mean, that's the whole point of this discussion. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 maybe they are equivalent. No, 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 that's okay. So, so uh, the aim of this, so just let me just complete this part here to say that uh, so if not, if, if this is not, if, if not, then it, uh, meaning if there does not exist an S such that it becomes block diagonal, then if not, then such a representation is, is called irreducible. Actually, I'm a little bit simplifying this here. Yeah? Uh, uh, I'm a little bit simplifying this because that's all we're going to study. Uh, we're going to study only certain types of the algebras. Yeah? Uh, in, in general, I, I, wouldn't, I mean, in general, it's not even needed to say that it should be block diagonal. You can actually, the actual definition is not this. Huh? Actual definition is that, like one of the elements, let's say this guy is zero. Okay? Uh, yeah, this guy is zero. This could be anything, let's say one. Huh? In which case, still, you see there is one invariant subspace. This part doesn't mix with that. Oh no, other one. This part doesn't mix with that. Correct? I mean, one of the parts doesn't mix with that. Okay? That's enough. In that case, you say it's, irredu it's reducible. So this block diagonal is a bit too strong. I, I don't need to say that. I just all I need to say is that there exists. So it's a, the precise, more precise definition is there exists an invariant sub, proper proper invariant subspace. Proper invariant subspace. That's a that's a more 
that is the definition you will find in the mathematics literature. That's all you need. Um, but it just turns out that the kinds of algebras we'll be studying, this implies block diagonal division. But uh, this is the correct definition. But I gave a simplified definition because that's what we'll be using. We'll be in the cases that we'll be considering, all the SUOS or all the semi simply algebras, that is true. This statement is true. Sorry, did I confuse you? <laughs> I mean, what I'm saying is this is the, if you look at any mathematics literature, uh, or even I think in the notes, the, the, this is the definition which is given. Okay? This is the correct definition. That, there, uh, uh, the, uh, that if, there if there exists a, a proper invariant subspace, proper meaning in neither the full space or not the trivial space, which is a zero dimensional space. Something in between, no? Uh, a proper invariant subspace. Invariant means that under the action of the Lie algebra, this, uh, uh, if you take a vector from here, it doesn't go to the remaining part. Yeah. <coughs> you say this because uh, a distance row uh, on that block might mix with the bigger block, yeah. but it is not block diagonal, although it is a yeah. subspace. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. So here you see that if, if it's like this. If I take a vector here, let's say one here, then that will can mix with that, right? But not other way around. If you take a vector here, this will never go over there. Right. But the reason, okay, I mean, I don't want to go into that. Maybe later when I discuss the metric, notion of a metric on the Lie algebra, then probably it will become clearer. Okay? Because, uh, uh, I mean, in the classes of Lie algebras we'll talk about, there is a non-degenerate metric. Okay. And using this non-degenerate metric, you can decompose into orthogonal components. Okay. But uh, we, I don't know if we'll arrive there or not. But, uh, but uh, for, for all practical purposes, we'll, we always assume this. Hmm? Although the correct definition is Which coincides with this in the cases that we'll be considering. Good. That's all. Okay. Uh, now, so, so uh, the upshot of it, it is that it is enough then to, to learn about the irreducible representations. Because if you know all the irreducible representations, then you can construct any reducible representation that you wish. No? So the aim now will be to construct irreducible representations of SU2. Hmm? Okay, so let me just start with this. Eh? I, I will start the discussion and then we will continue with tomorrow. So, what is the idea here? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, what we will do is, uh, uh, the, this is the technique. Uh, so, okay, remember we have this three matrices, sigma three, and now I will remove the i because it is more convenient to use Hermitian basis. Because, uh, you know, eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices are real numbers, no? So it is more convenient. Otherwise, it, your eyes will be floating around everywhere. So we'll just use sigma 3 and sigma 1 times sigma 3, right? Uh, and this satisfies all these computation relations. But let us choose a, a particular combination, sigma 1 plus minus i sigma 2. And let's call this uh, E plus minus, and let's call this guy as H. I'm just do. I'm just trying to stay with the notation of the nodes. So I call sigma three as H, and these two combinations as E plus and E minus. Okay. Now what is very interesting is that if you take the commutation relation of H with E plus or E minus, let's take first with the E plus, or let's put both here. That's the same as sigma three with sigma one plus minus I sigma two. Right? I mean, I'm just substituting the definition. Now, sigma 3 with sigma 1, so this becomes sigma 3, the uh, commutation relation, you can open it up, it's linear, so plus minus i sigma 3 sigma 2. Okay. Now, sigma 3 with sigma 1, remember that sigma a sigma b commutator was 2i epsilon a b c sigma c. Right. Actually, maybe there's a factor of uh, Two, two also probably. Let me just see. 
2h, okay, it doesn't matter. No, here, here sigma is just written as t1 plus i2. Okay. Okay. Now maybe it would be more convenient to put a half. Okay, we will come that, come to that. So what is this guy? Uh, so if I take three and one, so three, one, two, right? So I will get here two i sigma two, right? And plus minus i and sigma three with two. So three, two, one, but that's a minus sign. Mm -hmm. So you get here minus two i. Uh, sigma 1. Right? So you get here the, the minus i times i becomes plus. So the 2 co comes out as a common factor. In fact, let me write it as plus minus 2. I take it out. So plus minus 2, if I take it out, then first term is sigma, uh, this term is sigma 1. And this term is plus minus i sigma 2, which is the same as plus minus 2. Uh, e plus minus. So the e plus and minus are raising and lowering in the exactly. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I need to normalize it a bit. I will uh, because I want one. Uh, the one because I mean it's just more convenient. Because what it does, I mean, so you see what has happened. So we are saying that this is equal to plus minus 2 e plus minus. Okay. But so that means it increases, it raises or lowers by two units, right? Mm -hmm. So it is more convenient mm -hmm. to normalize it so that it is raises or lowers by one unit. But that I can do by just taking h to be sigma 3 by 2. Mm -hmm. If I take h, h to be sigma 3 by 2, there's a half here. A half, everywhere there's a half. So this becomes half, and that goes out, and is left with that. So I take the sigma 3, uh, h to be sigma 3 by 2, and uh, define it like that. In fact, I can also divide by 2 here. That doesn't matter. That is irrelevant, because that 2 will be on both sides. Okay. The important point is to uh, normalize the h by sigma 3 by 2. Now furthermore, uh, I think if I look at this thing probably, probably I, I need to also divide by 2 to get the second. This is equation 6.26 okay, on the notes. Uh, this is one of the equations, 6.26. The other equation is E plus E minus, comes later, is 2H. Uh, and probably for this again I need to divide by, so let's just check that also. Uh, I think maybe for this also I need to divide by 2 in the definition. Okay. It's not so important. I mean, these numbers are not so important, actually. But it's just, uh, so this is sigma 1 plus, as it's, as it's written, sigma plus i sigma 2, commuted with sigma 1 minus i sigma 2. So what is that? There will be several terms, four terms, where sigma 1 and sigma 1 is 0, so I don't need to worry about that. Did that with that is minus i, sigma 1 sigma 2 is 2 sigma 3, 2 i sigma 3, right? Just using that uh, relation, sigma 3. Then you have a plus i, then sigma 2 sigma 1, which is minus 2i sigma 3. Right? So you'll find here 4 sigma 3. Okay? Is it correct? 4 sigma 3. So if I want to get this normalization, 2h, 2h. If I h is already sigma 3 by 2, so I actually want to get, I want to get the sigma 3 instead of 4 sigma 3, but that can be done by just defining the, this guys also by 2. So there's overall 1 fourth. So that's that. So basically you divide it by 2. This is just to get a convenient thing. It's not important, not any principle, any reason that it should be. It's just convenient. Also. Good. So, okay, now uh, I will uh, describe it uh, uh, tomorrow in detail. But so, what is the idea? This is exactly, you see, this operator is, I mean, this commutation, this is not so important at this stage. But this is the commutation relation which is most important right now. We'll come to that also later, but this is the most important thing. What is it saying? That, I mean, 
so suppose I am given some representation of H uh, of this S U two. Some representation is given. So this H will be mapped to some matrix, right? And similarly, E plus E minus will also be mapped to some matrix. But in particular, let's focus on H. Huh? H is Hermitian, so I can always diagonalize it, okay? And I will have some eigen. It will be diagonal elements with eigenvalues. Okay? So suppose I start it. Suppose I consider. Uh, suppose I start with. Uh, I will use sometimes I will use this bra and ket notation. You are familiar with in quantum mechanics. Huh? So there is this some representation of R, R of uh, H. Okay, will act on. Suppose if it's n by n. It will act on an n-dimensional n vector space, and uh, let's say there is some vector here. Uh, there is some eigenfunction of that, of this, huh? because I, as I said, I can diagonalize the emission. I can diagonalize it, so it will be some number. Let's say lambda times p. Hmm? Suppose I found some eigenfunction of R H. Now I can ask the question: What happens if I apply e plus and e minus? On this vector, so let's apply R e plus or minus on on this vector, okay. and ask the question: Is it also an eigenfunction of R h or not? That's the first question. And if yes, then what is eigenvalue? Okay. That's a question. So let's see. So I, I, I just apply to find whether it's an eigenfunction. I apply this R of h. If it comes back to itself up to some number, it's an eigenfunction. Well, let's uh, we apply that here. But that is the same. And now I use the this commutation relation because remember, a representation will preserve the commutation relation. Mm -hmm. So this guy, I write it as a commutator of R H comma R E plus minus. Okay. So I write it like this. So at the, at the moment it's just a product. This times that, okay. But I write it as this times that minus the other way around. But then I have to subtract. I have to add the thing which I subtracted, right? So plus r e, e plus minus times r of h. This is ordinary matrix multiplication. All of this acting on the state v, on this uh, original state v. Right? Now this one I already know. Because R H acting on V is nothing else but lambda V. Lambda is a number. I can take it out. So this term, this this term is simply lambda times R E plus minus acting on V. The second term. First term, on the other hand, I use this commutation relation. That this is equal to that. Okay. So since the representation preserves it, so therefore what we are saying is that this commutator is nothing else but plus or minus R. Of e plus minus, and that is acting on v. So it, this becomes these two terms become that. Okay. Right. So so now you see that uh, this is a number. That's again plus minus a number. So altogether, this expression becomes. Uh, so this becomes lambda. Plus minus one r e plus minus p. Okay, so we are saying that when R H acts on this state, it gives you lambda plus minus one times the same state. So this state is again an eigenfunction, and we also know what the eigenvalues are. Eigenvalues are lambda plus or minus one. So that is why. These two operators, e plus and e minus, are called raising and lowering operators. Because when you apply the e plus, eigenvalue increases. When you apply e minus, eigenvalue decreases by one step. So this idea. Like so, uh, so the way we will construct uh, tomorrow, we will construct these things is that give me some representation, and okay, take one of the states which is an eigenstate of R H. I can always find a state like that. Then start applying e plus and e minus. Eigenvalues will keep increasing on one side and decreasing on the other side. Okay. At some point, it should stop because if it doesn't stop, it will go all the way up to infinity. And we are interested in finding finite-dimensional representations. Okay. So this process must stop somewhere, up, upwards, also downwards. 
Uh, and then that way we'll be able to construct all the possible representations. So th this will be the strategy. Mm. This is a purely algebraic. There's no diff solving differential equations and you know, spherical harmonics and so on. You just uh, get purely algebraic. And this is the same like in the harmonic oscillator when we deal with the creation and the elimination. Yeah. But that's of course unbounded. I mean, you yeah. can keep going, right? It's infinite dimension. Hilbert space are infinite dimension. But here we are looking at finite dimensional cases. I mean, finite dimensional representations, yeah. So we'll impose that at some point this process stops, both both ways. So so that will give very important conditions. And yeah. Uh, in the algebraic representation, I'm uh, in case of three. Uh, is there a matrix corresponding to the plus minus? Yeah, it's a. I mean, it's a thing. This R is any R, no? So uh, you just take now what what we were calling. I think we were using M. I think it is better to use instead of M. I was using M always because we started using this for a finite group element, right? But uh, it is better to use add, add it because it's a joint representation, AD. So AD of uh, uh, E plus and E minus would be uh, E plus minus is simply whatever what we call it, P1 plus minus IT2, or J1 plus minus IJ2. So now we have uh, I times a matrix. So yeah, there will be actually, yeah, this is already Hermitian. So then prob probably there will be R there, correct. Yeah. No, 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 what I mean is, uh, are we SO3 R or SO3 C? C, ah, C. Yeah, yeah, so we have complexity yeah. Indeed, at the moment I write sigma 1 plus I sigma 2, this has no Hermitian or anti-Hermitian property, right? Actually, you can see that uh, E plus dagger is E minus. So, so you are actually complexifying the D algebra, uh, precisely because we are interested in looking at all the eigenspaces and so on and so forth. I mean, this you cannot, if you look at this relation, uh, if, if you think about it, what does it mean? This is exactly the way the adjoint action, adjoint acts, right? Adjoint acts as a commutation relation. I mean, adjoint add at the level of group element acted as uh, G inverse sigma G. Right? Or xg, x is the d algebra element. At the level of uh, the uh, adjoint, in the, at the level of d algebra, if I write g is equal to 1 plus y, y is again part of a, a d algebra, then this is nothing else but the commutator of xy. Right? Uh, plus or minus, so either y and x, it doesn't, I'm not keeping track of signs. So to the uh, first order, it is just this. So commutator is the joint action. So this is really as H. Okay. So this I can write it as a joint of H acting on E plus minus. This is what it is. So what we are saying, uh, a joint H acting on E plus minus is plus minus times E plus minus. So this is an eigenstate of a, jo a joint H. And in general, you know that if you want to construct eigenstates, uh, eigen, eigen functions are, are complex. Right? This is the reason why we go to the complex list, to be able to write down eigenstates. Then uh, later on we can take real sections. Okay? But in this, in the intermediate stage we go to the complex uh, and then, you see that, that, that's the whole point. At the moment we can even think of E plus and E minus as independent object, not, no relation like this. But after doing all the calculations then we can impose these conditions. And then you get back again the you know your Hermitian objects because once you have this then I can always write e plus and d minus as uh, some her uh, some of Hermitian matrices like this so you can recover sigma one and sigma two hmm? but, but at this stage we'll just not impose those conditions right now actually I would uh, ask the question further but I don't know if we yeah. have time. Uh, then you are adding an imaginary uh, component to a matrix from SO3. Uh, are we still in SO3? Because entries should be real. Uh, are we allowed to so add entries? No, yeah, that is fine. But I mean, uh, you can uh, ask the T3. T3, so H is like sigma 3. So we are talking about T3, which is 0, 0, uh, sorry, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. zero. Now I want to ask, uh, but I mean, this is not, uh, if you look at that, uh, this is this is a joint representation, right? This add, this, so this will be the add of H, right? 
This H is nothing else but sigma 3 by 2. So that is the same as either a plus or minus T3. Okay? So that's that. But then, uh, this is not diagonal, you see. You want to diagonalize it. Uh, because we are, we are trying to find eigenstates. Uh, so if I want to diagonalize it, uh, you'll see that the eigenstates are exactly uh, you know, this, I think, uh, uh, probably, uh, you should check that. 1 plus minus i, 0. I think that would be the eigenstates. Huh? I you can check that. Mm. Yes, now right? the complex numbers pop out. Yeah, we do that. that's right. Uh, so it does not violate the SO3 structure, right? No, at the moment, it's, uh, now we're not, I mean, at the moment, it's not SO3, unless you impose some conditions. You see, the, uh, I mean, if I just treat E plus and E minus as something completely independent, then there's nothing. I mean, you need to impose finally this condition to recover sigma. But, but I'm asking it theoretically when we are making such a operation. Yeah. We end up with a, a diagonal matrix with some uh, bases which are involved with the complex numbers yeah. that are okay. pop out now, yeah? yeah. but they still satisfy uh, SO3 conditions which are determined as one and uh, transpose uh, is the inverse. Uh, yeah, here's the real right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but the matrices are from SO3. Yeah, yeah, but uh, here yeah, I'm just discussing the real algebra. Mm -hmm. There's only real algebra. So at the level of real algebra, of course, you have the condition as anti-symmetric. Mm -hmm. That is true, anti-symmetric. I mean, well, not in terms of eigen, once I go to the diagonal, I just like it's not true, right? I mean, this matrix, its eigenvalues are, uh, what are the eigen, uh, I think these are the correct eigenfunctions. Anyway, you, you can check it. So, right, it's true, right? I mean, even if I take a real matrix, the eigenfunctions will be complex. This is what's happening. I mean, if you want to use this method to com to construct the order representations, and you see that how how efficient this method is. Uh, I mean, even spherical harmonics, right? I mean, how do you write? You write if I take m quantum number, some fixed m quantum number, I am into the power of i m phi. It's complex, right? The Legendre polynomials are real, but uh, e to the i m phi is, is complex. Right, are complex, but the operations are. The eigen functions, functions are complex. Yeah. Eigen functions are the same. Yeah. In that case, yeah. yeah. In this case, we can have one and i uh, and such a vector, uh, but we can act on such a vector with SO3 matrices. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that uh, this, act, if you just apply that, you'll get again uh, some number times plus minus the same thing object. No? I'm just trying to, my problem is to find the eigen functions of this object, this matrix. Eigen functions will in general involve imaginary numbers. Complex numbers, no. eigenfunctions. If it's a Hermitian operator, eigenvalues will be real, but eigenfunctions can be complex. This is, uh, of course, an anti-Hermitian matrix. So even the the eigenvalues will be pure imaginary. So it will be plus minus. Okay. Yeah. But it, I, it shouldn't bother you because even though in the intermediate process we are complexifying, uh, not the not the not this H is other guy. Right? Other guys were complexifying, but it, it doesn't matter. You go through the entire analysis. You will this way at the end we'll construct all the representations. We will so in particular we'll also construct R of E plus and R of E minus, and then at that level you check whether this is true. Okay. If it is true, then all of them are remission. Right? Yeah, I mean, then you can reconstruct, you can again, you can rewrite what is sigma 1 and sigma 2. Sigma 1, R sigma 1 will be R e plus plus R e minus by 2, right, or whatever. And you know, you can reconstruct R, R of sigma 1 and sigma 2, and they will be remission. So it shouldn't bother. Uh, and one can do that. And uh, we'll see that it's not just SU2, you can get other things, you know. SL2R by choosing different real sections. I mean, at the moment, as you say, it's com complex, right? But then you can define reality condition in many different ways. So in one way of defining it, you'll get SU2. In another way of defining it, you'll get SL2R, okay? And so on. Uh, so you can get uh, all sorts of things. Right? But in this uniform picture, you are actually discussing the, all the representations of all these different groups, or the Lie algebras. Yeah, so that problem is uh, postponed to the later step. You know? In the end, you do that. Then okay, so then we'll continue.
uh, from here onwards and construct all the representations.